Oh my goodness, we just got attacked, but they immediately died. I didn't even have time to process that. All of the champion Wakita rifles just fired in one go. Okay, um, you are terrifying. <laughs> Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. I'm the Spiffing Brit, and today we're playing Age of Empires 3, the War Chiefs expansion. That's right. We are in the fantastic Native American DLC expansion to the widely successful Age of Empires 3 game. Although when I say widely successful, I bet none of you have probably played it in the last five, ten years. Sadly, this game just does not hold up anywhere near as well as Age of Empires 2 or the brand new remastered Age of Empires 2, which are absolutely crushing it on Steam at the moment. But nonetheless, here we are playing Age of Empires 3. And what do I have in store for you today, the lovely ladies and gentlemen at home? Well, it's a fantastic exploit slash overpowered feature in this game, which allows the player to get the most overpowered units physically achievable, giving players not only the highest damage units, but also the hardest to kill units, which is, you know, probably not a good combination to have when you're playing against someone in this game. But I strongly recommend after this video that you grab a couple of friends and use this exploit on them, and then watch as all of your friends never play Age of Empires 3 again for the rest of their lives as they come to terms with what you've just done to them. Nonetheless, here we are playing Age of Empires 3. It's a fantastic game, it's a good laugh, and we're going to be doing a skirmish game against the AI. Now, as you can see, um, I am playing as the faction of the Sioux, or Sioi, or S-I-O-U. I have no idea of how to pronounce this name, I'm so sorry. Nonetheless, these lovely people are a Native American tribe. Now, if I was to say that the most overpowered faction in the game and the most defensive faction in the game exists, you'd probably think, oh, it might be, oh, oh, the Dutch, they could turtle up and do an economic victory, they're European. Actually, no, the most defensive faction in the entire game is the Sioi. Is the Sioi? Sioi, blah, blah. Oh my god, I'm so bad at pronunciation. From now on, these are just, these are just now the TP troopers, okay? So the TP troopers, despite not being able to build any defensive structures like walls, are actually the most defensive faction in the entire game. All other European factions can build massive towering stone walls to keep anyone out and defend their glorious empires. The TP troopers over here don't need to do any such thing. You see, their units are just immortal thanks to one simple building, the humble TP. Now before we start, ladies and gentlemen, you might be asking yourself, what is a TP? Good question. I gave it to Google myself. By definition, a teepee is a tent traditionally made from animal skin upon wooden poles. It's amazing. And also, you can buy one for only £2,285. Alternatively, you can buy several hundred copies of Age of Empires 3 for that and have as many teepees as you like. The choice is yours. Now, in-game, teepees are cheaper but also very overpowered. Now, in this game, you can create a deck. In our case, we have my deck, the game's default deck, and meme deck, the custom deck I have created. The meme deck is very unique. It provides us with an infinite source of resources via these cards here, a healthy supply of buffaloes, which are wonderful food sources, but most importantly, all of the TP upgrades any man could ever need. We've got improved buildings for increased building hit points, but in the second age, the more important bonuses, new ways. That's right, TPs can now provide us with certain unique European improvements. We also have nomadic experience expansion. TPs are cheaper, harder to destroy, and you can build more of them. And finally, friendly territory. TPs now boost attack as well as hit points. Okay, you're probably sat there thinking, what? What is this TP doing? What on earth do TPs even do? TPs in this game are tiny wooden structures you can plop down, and they provide a fantastic bonus. They give a plus 10% bonus to hit points, as well as a plus 10% bonus to attack. Now, you might be sat there thinking, that's quite a nice little bonus you could to get one TP down every once in a while and put one troop down and it'll get a nice relaxing resting bonus of plus 10% attack and plus 10% health. They'll fight a bit better. Well, this is where one minor coding issue in the game suddenly appears. See, the game developers didn't set a limit to the amount of times this bonus can stack. What this means is the plus 10% bonus to hit points from TPs is 10% when you have one TP, 20% when you have two TPs, 30% when you have three TPs. Oh, and guess what? You can build 20 bloody TPs if you wanted. So you build 20 TPs in one close position and suddenly you have a unit with plus 200% hit points. At the same time, units can also gain plus 200% damage from the TPs as well. You can also stack this with bonus.
bonuses from the fire pit, which increase troop damage already, which provide a plus 10% attack bonus, which actually doesn't stack on top of but multiplies the TP's attack, and suddenly you'll have the most dangerous units in the game. But wait, ladies and gentlemen, that's not all. The Sayoi faction, oh my god, I'm just so bad at doing this. I'm actually gonna have to Google it. How to pronounce, there we go. Sue. Sue. Seriously, it's just Sue. 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 <laughs> British pronunciation or American? Ooh. Sue. Oh, that's just boring. But that's not all, ladies and gentlemen. It gets worse. You see, the Sioux faction are meant to be Native American tribes who are effectively fighting against an ever-improving form of Europeans. In the early ages, the Europeans are slow, they're not that fast, they're getting their economy up and running. But in the later ages, the Europeans are able to get all of their technology bonuses and they will defeat most American tribes. So in order to make the game slightly more historically accurate, although it isn't very historically accurate at all, it gave the Sioux faction exceedingly high detail. DPS units. The idea being that these units would effectively become glass cannons. They'd be able to do high damage, but at the same time they wouldn't be able to take many hits, unless of course they were standing near a TP so they could get their health bonus. The only downside is when you have units with some of the highest base attack damage in the game, getting plus 10% bonuses on top of each other, you start getting an issue. It's not completely unheard of in this game for the best unit in the Sioux faction, the War Dog unit, to have over 1000 attack damage. There is no unit in the game with a thousand health, while well, excluding another Sioux unit. At the same time, you can get the Musketman, the longest range unit which the Sioux have access to, to do over 800 damage each shot. This means you can effectively have a massive wall of one-hit marksmen sat behind a wall of TPs, and your enemy will not be able to get close to you at all. They can't defeat you, and you have basically won the game. So ladies and gentlemen, grab yourself a cup of tea, sit back, relax, and hey, if you're feeling downright splendid, you can even give this video a like. As we're about to throw ourselves into a brand new game of Age of Empires 3 against seven completely random AI personalities. Who knows who they're going to be? They're going to be spicy. Oh my goodness, of course, the game makes us play against Queen Elizabeth. You know I'm not allowed to hurt a game. It's illegal. And yet you force my hand every time. So welcome to the game, ladies and gentlemen. As you can see, it's very much like Age of Empires 2, except they have fancy, super jazzy 3D graphics, which are pretty nice. 11 out of 10. Well done. They've also got random tracks tribes which are on the map who you can build trading posts with and gain lovely bonuses from and in fact yes our fantastic eagle catcher scout over here is discovered what tribe is this the simonele okay these are lovely people and we can build ourselves a trading post slap down right here and gain a bonus from them fantastic stuff oh we've got idle workers who we can immediately send out to harvest the berry bushes now unlike all other civs in the game we start with our pop limit actually at maximum at 200 this is certainly a nice place to be but unlike most factions in the game, we're actually exceedingly limited on various buildings. We can only really build fire pits, teepees, markets, farms and well a war hut and a horsey hut the most important building we've access to is of course the fire pit this bad boy is just so overpowered he's absolutely amazing oh we've gained our first bonus which means we can select our deck of course we're going to pick the meme deck because it's just so lovely and overpowered and with our first bonus we're going to pick the fourier trait because it allows us to gather food even faster this allows us to get more population down on the map as fast as humanly possible anyway with our trading post built we now gain the bonuses of the sim which means that they're giving us the bowyer bonus, which gives us bow making skills, I guess, so that our archers do more damage. This is going to be very useful because it will stack on top of the bonuses we're going to be giving our own archers already. Now, in the fire pit, we can do several things. Increase the production rate of units, or most importantly, perform a gift dance. Gift dance increases a resting XP bonus. XP is fantastic because the more XP we have, the more shipments we can bring in. Shipments can vary from bringing in 12 massive bisons, which will provide us with 20,000 food to also gaining us all of our fantastic abilities on the TPs. So naturally it's something you're going to want to rush as soon as possible. Now after gathering a bunch of food from the berry bushes, we're going to actually immediately start moving towards age 2. Age 2 is of course where we get our fantastic TP bonuses up and running and where the game's really going to come alive for us. Also make sure to pick up the Earth's bounty card very early on. It basically just means you're going to get a slow trickle of free resources for the rest of the game. And free resources, they're lovely. 
Oh yes, we've discovered also the Cherokee settlement over here, lovely. When we have a bit more of wood, we can actually slap down another trading post here and gain their lovely resources. Well, actually just their unique units really. Now, fantastic, we're able to pick up the hunting dogs bonus from the markets in age two, and that's going to allow us to turn off villagers who's working berry bushes over to working the bison instead. Bison are a free source of a bunch of food, which any player can gain ridiculously quickly. Bisons are brilliant. No one else has access to them, and they're going to provide us with a bunch of glorious bonuses. And there we go, we're in age two, so we can gain our first few TP bonuses. TP bonus number one, of course, is to pick up nomadic expansion so that TPs are cheaper to build, because currently building a TP, it costs 50 wood, and we can only build 10 of them. Oh, so expensive for so little reward. Don't worry though, ladies and gentlemen, that's not the way it's going to be forever. And there we go, nomadic expansion has arrived, meaning TPs are now only 35 wood to build, and we can build 20 of them. So as you can see, TPs, very, very cheap to make. And fantastic, we can also produce Cherokee riflemen, as well as the Cherokee war dance, so that all native units move faster. And of course, we count as a native unit, meaning all of our units increase in speed, which is lovely stuff indeed. Oh, my Napoleon colony just entered the colonial age, which is the same as ours. So that means the AI is actually starting to catch up, which is very spooky indeed. Now, what I've currently got going on is four villagers are running around in a circle to do a fertility dance so that our production of villagers is increasing. Basically, the more that they dance, the faster we produce villagers, <laughs> which is uh, going to start getting a little bit crazy very soon. But it's necessary because we need the food from the bison to make the villagers to gather the resources to then mass produce TPs. Anyway, baby production rate is up at 91%, which is lovely. Although we're going to now have to switch over from baby production rate to experience because I'd like to get more shipments in, please. So we gain four experience points per second, which means it's only going to take us, well, a very short period of time in order to get the next shipment in. As you can see, every single second ticks by and we just get closer to summoning more bonuses. Now, other people are starting to enter the colonial age, but don't worry, we're very close to actually getting our way into the fortress age, which is where our massive bonuses are going to really start adding up. And there we go, we get our next shipment from our home city. I'm going to pick up the friendly territory bonus, so the TPs now boost attack as well as hit points. As I mentioned, this is a plus 10% increase to attack, which affects all units you have, be they humble villagers, warriors, or archers. It all stacks. And as you can see, we are now ready to actually move our way into age three. Oh, lovely stuff. We're going to pick up the chief to give us 800 wood as soon as we level up. And what that means is we're going to be able to build all of our necessary defensive TPs. Now the fire pit meta is really coming into effect now because we're almost on shipment number seven. We haven't even hit the fortress age yet. Normally this is quite a challenge for any AI to do, but of course we're not an AI. Well, we are up to about 3000 food thanks to all of our ridiculous food supply, which is going on. My goodness. Now we're actually going to build our first set of archers because we might as well. These lovely Seaton bowmen, they're not very fantastic early game units, but they're pretty good against infantry. By themselves, they're really quite weak. Oh no, Quatermook is very displeased because we're already in Fortress Age and the AI has not predicted that such a thing could even occur. Oh no, I'm so sorry AI, you've got a few more surprises coming your way too. Now, as you can see, we have our squad of Seaton bows here. These are relatively normal dudes. They only have 90 health. They do an attack of 15 and oh my goodness, we're getting attacked by some Rodillos or whatever they are. They're just Spanish infantrymen. So we're going to send our five seat and bowmen. Oh my God, there's a lot of them. Okay, it's time to TP. All right, for this, we're going to need to build a bunch of TPs and TP turtling is about to begin. So the way TP turtling works is that these are buildings which infantry can pass through. And so you can just surround your entire base in them. You have 20 of them. So make sure to pack them in nice and tight. And as you can see, each TP goes down. And as each TP goes down, the health of our units is increasing. Now up to 131. The TPs build exceedingly quickly and they also require next to no resources. So you don't actually even need to use them in defensive strategies. If you want, you can use these TPs and send them straight to the front lines. And of course, we can also pick up new ways so that our TPs can give us bonuses beyond just the attack and health increases. So as you can see, we've got our TPs down. If we look at our seat and Bowman, their health is now up to 175, which is a bit of a strange number because they really should not have access to it. So there we go. We have a Seton bow here, which instead of having 90 health, which is what it's meant to have, now has 233. This is because it's receiving bonuses from 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 TPs, I'd say, in this position. Anyway, we can increase this stuff even more because we can now research infantry breastplates, which means our archer's hit points increase. But this is the base hit points, which increase, meaning that the scouts actually 
automatically gain even more bonuses. So these 291 hit point elite Seton Bowmen are about to get even healthier and even stronger. And there we go. With that, we now have a elite Seton Bowman over here with 315 health, which is perfectly balanced as you can imagine. But of course, Seton Bowmen aren't the best unit we have access to. The elite Wakan rifles are going to be much more overpowered in terms of their damage output. Now, TPs do have one weakness, that is that they can be destroyed, but with the improved buildings upgrades, our TPs are going to gain an increase in health. Normally, TPs, they only have about 300 health, but as you can see, they're already receiving 150 health point bonus, and that will increase with time. Oh, here's our Wakan rifles. Now, they actually have a base health pool of 85, which is lower than our archers, but once again, they can receive the bonuses of increased health points. The thing that really makes them nice and overpowered is the fact that their range damage is just oh so much higher. It's 20 base range damage for their first level without upgrades. This, of course, is increased when we get counter infantry rifling, so they do even more damage now. Oh, and also don't forget the lovely elite rifle riders. Rifle riders, of course, even more overpowered when it comes to TPs because their base hit point pool is so big. So as you can see, these rifle riders here now have a set of 549 hit points, which of course just makes perfect sense. You know, it's probably time for us to level up. So what we can do is sell some food for coin because we have infinite quantities of food and pay our way into the level four industrial age. Now, our lovely archers over here have had their base damage increase to 22, meaning they are much, much, much more dangerous to face in the field of battle. But their base attack damage is, of course, not their real attack damage. Ah, oh, yes, we've hit the point where we can no longer die. We have more men than probably most of the AIs and we cannot be defeated. This strategy is fantastic to use in multiplayer against friends, mostly because it doesn't particularly have a counter and generally ruins everyone's fun and experience. The bonuses each of your buildings can get are also pretty wacky. So for example, in the farm, you can just increase the hit points of all of your cavalry, which is great because that means the bonus they receive from TPs is even more overpowered. You can also get war drums so that all units train quicker. And my personal favorite, this you dog soldiers spend simply 1,500 food and you will have 10 of the most overpowered unit in the game get spawned in for you. These dog soldiers are incredible. They are absolutely great fun to use. And oh my goodness, who's this? Oh, it's a Dutch envoy just walking for our lands, right? You know what that means? Bowman, one hit him, yeet that bow and he's dead. <laughs> Ah, oh, there we go. We're in the industrial age, which means we have five axe riders that have just spawned in. And of course, these axe riders do 35 base hand attack damage. Although once again, that is increased every 10% for each nearby TP they're standing near, which is a lot, of course. Our elite shark tooth archers as well, which we've hired from the AI, also now have a 115 base health, which we've increased to 187 and their base attacks up to 24, which of course we've increased as well. Uh, but also we can get champion seat and bowman now, which are even more jazzy. I mean, get champion Seminoles as well. Oh, this is just lovely. Everything's going our way. How many people have we got in the magical fire pit? Only 16? Let's get more people into the magical fire pit. Lovely stuff. And we can also switch them to fertility dance so we get people into the fire pit faster. And fertility dance kicks in and look at that pop growth go. Yes, lovely. Remember, food is no worry whatsoever because we have infinite quantities of it. Okay, we've now got 23 villagers on the fire pit. And what that means is our villager production rate was actually 241%. Instead, I've decided to switch them over to experience production, and now we're gaining 13 experience a second, meaning we get in a shipment roughly every few minutes or so. Another way to gain experience is, of course, fighting, but of course, fighting means people can die, and we're just not about that, unless, of course, it involves TPs, in which case we're all up for that. Speaking of which, let's send some TP warriors in. So I'm going to be demonstrating here just how great the TP is by sending our lovely units out to fight. Oh, here comes the French. Lovely. Now, fighting them is, of course, a challenge. Our men can die. Luckily, there's almost none of them here, so we will win this easily. Oh, no. They've got a bunch of riflemen in the background. So, what do you do? Simply build a TP right in the middle of the combat field. Some would say it obstructs the cavalry. Instead, I like to say it defends us from the flanking Spanish who are coming around the side as well. And there we go. Fantastic. We're gaining its health bonus and attack bonus. And this should hopefully give us a slight chance of defeating all of these attacks at the same time. Oh, my goodness. Yes, we managed it. We have minimal casualties too. Right, pull out of there. We only had two teepees. It's not enough. We must leave. 
And of course, when you're done with your TP, simply blow them up as they're really not necessary and don't provide you any bonuses if they're just sat out in the middle of nowhere. Anyway, we've got another shipment we can do. And of course, that shipment is going to be the old way so that all of our big button upgrades are cheaper. What are the big button upgrades? Well, they're like the CU Dog Soldiers or the New Year Festival, which provides you with 2,000 experience points, which is just incredible. Just 500 of every resource and you'll get 2,000 experience, which is enough to call in basically an entire shipment by itself. Anyway, we actually even have another shipment ready and we're going to invest that into the extensive fortifications so that all of our buildings have more defense. Lovely stuff. Oh, it's good to have the units back. And there we go. All of our big button upgrades are cheaper so that the CU dog soldiers are only 750 food to now summon and the war drums are just ridiculously cheap. There we go. Now everything trains faster. And there we go. Now for only 250 of every resource, we get 2000 experience points, which is just lovely. <laughs> Absolutely lovely. Oh, I love the big button upgrades. They're just so perfectly fantastic. Fantastic. Oh my goodness, what's this? We just captured a bunch of villagers. Oh, they've just got a bunch of men standing here in the middle of nowhere. Lovely. And of course, don't forget to build yourself a plantation so that you can get the gun trade up and running. Gun trades increase the attack of all of your rifle units. And trust me, you're going to be having a lot of rifle units because they're your highest DPS units in the game. And here we have it, our legendary champion Wakina rifles with a base output of 28, which is very nice. Although it's not its actual attack damage because of course we have all of our 10% increasing TPs, which have probably skyrocketed this champion Wakina's rifle output damage to around about the region of 500 or 400. 500 or 400, of course, is more than enough to one-shot most cavalry units in the game. As you can see, the Eagle Catcher Scout here, despite the fact that he has 500 hit points, this is because he's, of course, a champion, his actual amount of hit points is 3,301 because, you know, he's just around so many TPs. The TPs really make him feel good about the game. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness, we just got a attacked but they immediately died i didn't even have time to process that all of the champion wakita rifles just fired in one go okay um you are terrifying <laughs> you are really really terrifying just how powerful these units are is crazy we haven't even got all of our teepees we've got eight more teepees we could slam down anywhere we like we've actually also got coyotes which we can train and these also receive the bonuses of being near buildings and teepees meaning their 14 hand damage is amplified even more same for our lovely riflemen who do 19 ranged attack. This is all fine. Everything is fine here. Let me summon the dog soldiers so that you can see just how even more it can be broken. So the dog soldiers, provided you've been in the game for 30 minutes, you're going to get 10 dog soldiers. These units, the only other way you can produce them is by doing a little dance in the fire pit. And trust me, it's worth it because these guys are crazy. So here's a champion dog soldier. As you can see, quite a lovely specimen. He has 2,500 health sat in this position here, and he does a base normal hand attack damage damage of 42. This is of course a 2 times bonus against artillery and a 1.5 times bonus against infantry. What this actually means, because of all of the surrounding TPs, is his hand attack bonus against artillery is actually almost over 1000. It's not unheard of in this game for it to actually be quite common for a very experienced Sioux player to send in a bunch of dog warriors with over a thousand damage. What happens when you run into them? Well, that's basically it. You can't win the game. No matter what you'd like to do, there's probably nothing you can do because against a unit with 2,000 health, which is going to take almost an entire army to defeat, which has the ability to one-hit everything you own, there's not particularly much you can do. I also have six very unique cavalry units here. These are the Tanushki Prowlers because they have a bonus where the more of them there are in one big group, the more attack they have, which is pretty strange. It basically means if you get all 25 or so that you can spawn in and just have them in a big blob, they'll actually shred up most people. And of course, yes, they receive the bonus from TPs. Of course they do. Why wouldn't they? I've also discovered that my auto clicker can lead to some very strange sound cues in this game. Yep, or alternatively, we can have the Mega Bork. Oh, and of course we can perform a war dance as well, which increases the attack of all units by 30%. Yes, this just gets added to everything. Oh, it's fine. Trust me. Really nice balance. Great game balance. Incredible balance. Well done game. Oh God. <laughs> We can also do a little thing here to increase our War Chief's hit points using the uh, lovely fire pit. So we've increased our War Chief's hit points by 78%. We can, of course, run him into the teepees. And what this now means is that his resting health point is around about 6,800, which is... I don't make that 7,000. Oh, welcome back to Age of Empires 3, ladies and gentlemen. As you can see, we've kind of hit the end game. Uh, we are immortal. We cannot be defeated. And we've won the game. You see, the eagle catcher here is completely and utterly broken. He leads an army 
of coyotes, which I guess I can send around for just food to go murder people. But most importantly, he is absolutely immortal with 8,615 health. Oh no, we're getting attacked by the AI. How on earth can we ever even defend ourselves from such a dangerous thing? Well, it turns out we can just one hit most of the units that we're fighting. Yes, they all just stand in front of us, receive one hit and die. Well... Um, how much damage did we take? Oh, what's that? Hardly any damage and we can just heal it immediately? Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. Yes, welcome ladies and gentlemen to the completely and utterly balked version of Age of Empires 3. Oh yeah, this is uh, where the game is basically done. The AI can't defeat us and from this point on they will send ever increasing quantities of waves towards us to just harass us, but none of which will be able to defeat even one unit. Because each of our units will have far too much health and do far too too much damage. You see, even all of my army combined, if they didn't have the attack bonus, couldn't take down our war chief with over 7,000 health. I mean, just look at the guy. Apparently he's doing 275 swashbuckler attack. I mean, I don't know how that happens, but you know, this guy is just downright incredible. His attack damage and prowess, it's just completely unmatched. Basically, he can't die. Even if he was getting attacked, we could probably outheal the attacking force, which is just downright stupid. So there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. I do believe that's enough Age of Empires 3 for one day. I've absolutely loved recording it, and hey, if you've enjoyed watching us destroy the game balance here today, then feel free to give the video a like and hop down into the comments section below, so I'd like to hear which Age of Empires game is your favourite. Equally, what game would you like to see next on the channel? I'm going to throw a couple of options to you, the fantastic people at home. Would you like to A. See the return of Skyrim, B. See myself cover one of the age-old classic RDS games, or C. Something else entirely, maybe suggest it yourself in the comment section and provide me with a lovely reason as to why I should break your game in particular and destroy all of your childhood nostalgia about playing that game. Anyway, stay safe out there, ladies and gentlemen, and make sure to keep refilling those cups of tea. As always, a massive thank you to each and every one of my majestic patrons who make these fantastic videos all the more possible. Seriously, without your support, we'd certainly be facing a few more difficulties in this very strange period of history which we find ourselves in, where it's increasingly difficult to maintain a stable income on YouTube, mostly thanks to a fantastic recession currently going on in the background. Anyway, these are the, just the things you have to deal with. Comes with the job, don't worry. And hey, if you're wondering what video you'd like to watch next because you quite enjoyed this one, look no further than the two on screen now. I've chosen them to be kind of perfect for you, so you should probably give them a nice watch. Anyway, I'll see each and every one of you in the next one. Have an absolutely lovely day, ladies and gentlemen, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.